fixing the money thing. Proverbs 18.21 reminds us, the tongue can bring death or life. Those who love the talk will reap the consequences. What are you reaping in your life? Today, the power of your words on fixing the money thing. So grab your Bibles, buckle your seat belts. I hope someone would say it. You know, you get learn after a while what I'm going to say. Buckle your seat belts, and we're going to jump into the word. Today's title is Loose Lips Sink Ships. And of course, that phrase has been around a long time. It's from World War II. I'll talk more about that here in just a minute, but it's going to be a message that you'll want to take notes on for sure. You are living in a day of extreme, intense spiritual deception and conflict. Spiritually, things are stirring. You know that. And so now is not the time to be asleep spiritually. I'll tell you right now. You don't want to be asleep. You need to hear the Holy Spirit on a daily basis and let him move you, warn you, lead you. But you need to walk by the Spirit in this day and hour. Now, a scripture that we've pointed out many times in the past is 1 Peter chapter 5. I want to look at this with you real quick. It says, uh, verse 8, be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, say my enemy. enemy. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now you have, a, you have an enemy. You need to understand you are in spiritual warfare. You may not acknowledge it. You may not say yes, but I'm telling you, you are in warfare. And your survival in this warfare depends on your knowledge of how to handle it. So let's take a look at this scripture a little closer. The definition of sober means to be circumspect, which that word means careful to consider all circumstances and possible consequences to be prudent, to to be watching. And so you need to be aware of what's happening around you, right? Uh, let's Let's be honest. If there really was a lion outside your door that was trying to get your family, how would that change your actions? You would definitely take some defensive actions there and some offensive actions. You'd lock your doors. You'd probably carry a sidearm. You'd probably, you know, watch that lion and learn his patterns and tell the kids to stay out. And it would change how you live. Is that right? Well, knowing you have an enemy should change how you live as well, because you have an enemy who is not just a costume, red costume with a pitchfork. Your enemy wants to take you out, out. And so you need to be aware of that. Now, what are we alert for? The Bible says to be alert and sober. So what are we alert for? We are alert for deception and fear. Now, here's the problem with deception. You know what I'm going to say next. People that are deceived don't know they're deceived. What is the only antidote for deception? Truth. But people that are deceived think they have the truth. So you you have to have an absolute. And the absolute is the word of God. And it is the truth that you judge truth by, not feelings, nothing else. The word of God has to be your compass in this day and hour of what is truth, able to recognize deception. Let me, let me make this um, one comment. You need to take a note of this. If there is fear, I said be on alert for fear and deception. Fear is an indicator of deception. Fear is not of God, Right? Every promise is yes and amen. So fear, if there's fear in your life, it is an indicator that you're already deceived. You're already believing something that's not true, correct? So in fear shows its head in your life, you need to attack it with truth. And so you need to be on the alert. If fear pops up in your life, you need to realize, wait a minute, there's, I don't have faith, I have fear. What does God say about that situation? You need to back up and capture that moment and you need to deal with fear before it deals with you, right? Come on now. That's right. You know, you have to speak to fear. When fear speaks, fear speaks, is that not right? Thoughts, those thoughts speak to you consistently. And unless you speak back, 
you're going to continually digging in a hole that you're hard to get out of. You need to speak back to fear louder than it's speaking to you with the truth of God's word. I know as a young pastor, you know, I was facing some issues. And of course, I think we all face issues, but uh, I was praying and nothing was happening. And so I was praying to God, why aren't these things happening? Why aren't these things fixing? You know, why are these things still hanging around? And he gave me a dream and I saw a closet and uh, this closet was a, a closet of shelving. Everything in the closet was in the floor, a big pile of books and things. The shelves were empty. And in the dream, I heard the voice of the Lord say, speak to it. And so I said in my dream, I said, in the name of Jesus, go back where you're supposed to be. And everything on the floor went whoosh, on the shelves, perfect, in order and neat and peace, peace. I like that. And what was God trying to show me? Gary, you've got to take authority here. You've got to speak to this situation. And until you do, it's not going to change. He was teaching me how the kingdom operates. Listen, Jesus never prayed to God to fix a problem. It is not in the Bible you'll ever see Jesus pray to God to cast a demon out, pray to the Father to heal someone. Jesus always operated in authority and spoke to the situation. He's our role model. This is how it works. Matthew 17, 14 is a, is a story we read many times. But basically it says in verse 14, when they came to a crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him, Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire, into the water and the fire. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Jesus said, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy and he was healed at that moment. You see, Jesus knew who he was. He understood the authority he had. He understood how to release that authority and how to handle the situation. Unfortunately, so many believers do not know how to handle it. When things don't align right, you know, the Bible says this and they're seeing this, people make a decision to change their doctrine instead of asking God what went wrong, right? Listen, God's word never changes. If something is changing, it's not God's word. You can always know it's on your end. It's someplace you've missed it. It's someplace that short-circuited the kingdom of God. And your knowledge of how the kingdom operates is so important in warfare. Acts 19, verse 13. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of the Jesus, <laughs> whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Now, Paul was casting demons out and healing people in this town. And they were seeing that and were pressed by the power of God being demonstrated. They said, well, I'll try that. And so they said, in the name of Jesus, you know, that Paul deals, you know, Paul's using. Uh, the Jesus, yeah. Uh, and so verse 15, one day the evil spirit answered them. Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Now here's what I want to ask you. Who are you? Let me ask you, how well known is your name in hell? Hmm? They don't want to mess with Paul's house. They know about Paul. They know about Paul. They know Jesus. But who are you? What's your answer going to be? See, if you don't know who you are in Christ, you don't know your legal rights, who you are, the authority you stand in, what truth is, you won't have the right answer. You have to understand that. How well is your name known in hell? Well, let me go back uh, to Romans 10.10 10 for a moment. Romans 10.10 10 says you believe in your heart and you are justified, meaning that you believe you're in faith. It's legal for heaven to invade your life, but that sentence goes on and says, then you do what? Then you confess unto salvation. Then you release that anointing. 
See, I had the anointing all over me, but I hadn't released it yet. I have the jurisdiction over my life. God was trying to show me, Gary, you've got to agree with heaven that this is a finished work. You've got to come into agreement. You know that I heal, but you've got to come into agreement that you are healed based on Mark eleven twenty four. So when I said, when I said I am healed, bam, that's when the power of God was released in my life to bring the healing that took place. See, most Christians wait on God. They're waiting for God to do something. And what I want to help you understand today is you have your part to play in this thing, how it operates. Now, you remember after I was healed of those sugar swings and all that panic attacks, that the spirit of fear kept trying to bother me. And I've told you this, this before, you know, that God uh, told me in my office one day, he says, listen, Gary, you're going to have to rebuke this thing. You're going to have to deal with this. You need, to, you need to tell this thing to back up and back off in the name of Jesus. And so that, remember, that's what I did. You've heard my story. I went into the restroom at my office complex, and I, I just had a little discussion with it. Not God, with it. And I said, in the name of Jesus, I bind you, you foul spirit of infirmity, you spirit of fear. This is not legal. I take my authority over you, and I command you to leave now in the name of Jesus. And God said, pay no attention to your emotions. This is a legal issue. I felt sick. I mean, the fear was still, I felt those tormenting thoughts start to, you know, didn't leave right then. I went in my office, sat down for about 20 minutes in my office chair, and all of a sudden the anointing came on me, and I told you before, you've heard, I saw that demon leave, that black thing right through the ceiling, and I was free, and I was excited. And I tell people all the time, that's when I called Drenda and said, let's get us some Chinese food. I am free. <laughs> Everyone that reads my books, you know, when I, they read my books, I go preach at churches. They always serve me Chinese food. We read your books, Pastor. We know you like to celebrate with Chinese food. <laughs> I said, yes, sir. But you know what God did show me? I had to rebuke that thing. I had to speak to it. I had to speak to it. God could not do that. I had to speak to that thing. I had to learn how this thing operated. I had to learn who I was in Christ. I had to learn the authority that he gave me. I had to deal with it. Anyway, I was facing some issues, and in the 2010 Provision Conference, this happened. Most of you have seen this, but God wanted to remind me of something. I think you need to be reminded of it as well. In my Bible, in a very difficult day, I had a dream one night. I wrote the dream in the front of my Bible because this is what the dream was. I was standing on a hill with a sword in my hand. Below me was an entire army with their swords raised. And the, the word of the Lord, a voice in my dream says this, don't underestimate yourself, Gary. And in that dream, I took my sword and I began to scream the word Thor, T-H-O-R, Thor! And I began to run down the hillside towards this army by myself with my sword extended. And I thought, I, I, we have some people in the church that understand languages. I said, what is, the, what is that all about? What is the word Thor? And he said, it's a son of thunder. It's about thunder. Don't underestimate yourself. When the enemy sees you coming, Gary, it sounds like thunder. I wrote that. <laughs> is that really thunder? Is that you guys? <laughs> Woo! Woo! <laughs> Woo! Oh, that was so special, you know? And that was the only thunderclap that was, that we heard that was there. We went outside, there's one cloud above the church. Uh, it wasn't even raining. And uh, so right on cue, man. I mean, that was God. He was just saying, amen. You have the authority. Go deal with it, right? That was so cool. But you say, well, how do I sound like thunder? Matthew chapter 8, talked about the centurion. Remember him, the centurion? 
He had a sick servant, and he told Jesus, Lord, I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. Just say the word, and my servant will be healed, for I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go, and he goes, and that one come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. Oh, so what's he saying? He's saying, look, when I talk to one of my guys under my authority, my voice doesn't sound like my voice. My voice sounds like, can you guess? Caesar's voice. And when I hear my commanding officer speak to me, I don't hear his voice. I hear Caesar's voice. So when you speak on behalf of the Lord, you speak his word, guess what you sound like? You sound like Jesus. Same authority, same twang, same everything. The devil can't tell it's you. In fact, the Bible says, submit to God, resist him, and he'll flee in terror. That word terror in the Greek means run in terror. It means submit him and he'll flee, run in terror. Because it sounds like it's the same authority of God himself when you speak. So listen, I've said this many times, stop begging and stop wishing Jesus would come and tell you how to deal with things. You don't, listen, you already have everything. But if Jesus would just show up my bedroom, he'd tell me what to do. He put the spirit of God in you, friend, to be your counselor. That's what the book of John says. He already gave you his authority, his spirit, his word, the entire kingdom. You already have it all. You already have it all. But most people do not know how to dot the I and cross the T. They don't know how to bring it to a close, how to bring it in the earth realm. Listen, demons don't care how big God is in your, your life. They don't care that you come to church. They do care if you learn who you are in Christ, learn the authority that Jesus gave you, and you actually go out and advance into this territory. Listen, the Bible teaches us, you're like Joseph. Remember Joseph in the Old Testament? In prison, accused of raping Potiphar's wife. That is a lifetime, you don't get out sentence. A Hebrew in an Egyptian prison, it's over. Of course, Pharaoh has a dream, remember, and then Joseph interprets it. In Genesis 41, 39, it says, Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and as wise as you. I bet you could take this whole thing and just preach it. It's like, since God has made all this known, what's the Holy Spirit supposed to do? In 1 Corinthians 2 chapter, things you've not thought, seen, or heard, the Holy Spirit's going to reveal to you. Come on now, help me out. There is no one so discerning and as wise as you. Hey, that's us. We're ready for promotion here. Right? You shall be in charge of my palace. This is Pharaoh talking to Joseph. All my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne, I'll be greater than you. Now, Joseph is a type of Christ. He's the deliverer. He's a type of Christ. And so as we talk about what happened to Joseph, let me ask you this. Where are you seated at spiritually? Ephesians 2nd chapter. Come on, help me out. Where are you seated at? On the right hand of the Father with Jesus. So only Father is above you. You have all the same authority Jesus has. And so this is a picture. This whole story is a picture of what the church actually has. Let's go on. Speaking of the palace, all my people. Pharaoh says, all my people. Well, God told us in Hebrews that uh, chapter 114, all angels, all angels, all angels are ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. All God's people, all his people. This is a, this is a picture of where you're at. All God's people, his angels are now to back you up. Let's go on. This, gets, this is great. Verse 41. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Jesus says, I give you the keys of the kingdom. Are you getting this? This is your territory. You have jurisdiction here. God gave you the jurisdiction, the authority to rule this place. I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh, this is this, took his 
signet ring. Now, the signet ring, when the king made a decree, he stamped it with his ring. It represented his authority, made it law. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. What does that mean? Joseph, you're in charge. You have my authority. What you say goes. Are you getting this? This is about you. This is prophetically speaking about you, the church. He was dressed in a robe of fine linen, gold chain, the prosperity of the kingdom. Around his neck, he had him riding a chariot. He had access to the entire kingdom of Egypt as his second in command. And the people shouted before him, make way. Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word, no one will lift a hand or foot in all Egypt. Unless you speak, Joseph, nothing will be done. This is prophetic to you. This is a picture of the church. You have his authority. You, have, no, you say, oh, I wish, that was, I wish that was my story. Man, and you know, I feel like I'm in prison right now, Pastor. You know, I wish I had someone deliver me out of this thing and I had all the wealth of whatever and I had, you know. You, you do. You have been. In fact, you're listed in the New Testament. In Luke chapter 15, we find the exact same story. The parable of the lost son. When the son comes home, the father says to his servants, quick, bring the best robe, the linens, the finest linens. He's ro you're royalty now, right? Put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, the signet ring. You have the authority of the estate of the king. Put sandals on his feet, same same meaning the same thing as a chariot, you now have access to cover the entire territory. And the fatted calf is the same thing as the gold around his neck, the necklace of gold. You have the prosperity of the entire estate. Are you getting this? This is you. This is you. Can, can you imagine having to beg if you were Joseph for a meal? Of course not. I mean, he's in charge. He has the signet ring. What he says goes. You have the authority to speak. Hi, I'm Gary Cassie, and you will never fulfill your destiny until you fix your money thing. Visit GaryCassie.com and don't forget to hit the subscribe button below for more amazing weekly videos on fixing your money thing. And thanks for watching.